We're looking at some scenes from Metropolis from 1927, directed by Fritz Lang. It takes place in the year 2026, interestingly enough, so I guess get ready. This is how things are going to look in, in five years. The elite of Metropolis live in this beautiful uh, Art Deco looking city with skyscrapers and slow moving airplanes weaving in between little skyscrapers and uh, you know modern trains, etc. And the great masses live underground in this, this kind of sprawling hellhole. It's like a combination of a basement and a, uh, a prison colony, I guess. Um, it's not really clear what they produce or, you know, how the wealth in this society is actually generated. But we do know that the workers work on things like the, the heart machine, which is like the power plant of the whole city. The whole place runs on this unyielding 10-hour clock. Uh, the shifts change every 10 hours. The clock motif is important here. I'll outline some of the characters next. There's Joe Friederson, the big boss, a uh, dictator. He's in charge of the whole society, it seems. He's this super rich, super powerful, and apparently super evil and manipulative uh, patriarch. His son, Master Freighter, was of course born into the lap of luxury as, you know, the big, big boss's son, but, but the son rebels. He decides to be an ally of the masses. And the old man doesn't appreciate this, obviously. Freighter falls in love with Maria, who seems to be something like a combination social worker slash activist, I think. She cares for poor children and also sees herself as an ally of, of, the, of the poor. So Freighter follows her back into the workers' city underground, and he's shocked by how terrible their lives are. To make matters even worse, there's some industrial accidents in the city down below. Some deaths, injuries, and some very odd kind of religious imagery. It's a bit outside the scope of this video series in urban studies, so I'm going to leave that for others that are more qualified and interested in talking about that topic. There's an evil scientist, uh, Rod Wong, who creates an evil robot clone of Maria. And at the request of the big boss, Joe Federson, they use that robot to agitate the workers. Basically to stir up a fake revolution, so that Federson can then have an excuse to crush them and reassert his total control over this bizarre urban society. I won't spoil the whole plot, that's maybe, you know, two-thirds of it, so you're welcome. So let's just take stock for a second and see if this uh, sounds like anything going on more recently, perhaps, and uh, then make up your mind on whether the reality now is better or worse than we see here. We have this city that is beautiful, but only for that tiny percentage of the population that can afford to like enjoy that beauty, while most of the population, the vast majority of the population, toils away in these you know thankless, meaningless jobs that the city relies on. The city needs them. They're they're essential to the city, almost uh, essential workers, you might call them. Um, so they're you know they're needed obviously, but they're treated terribly. And then another one of the key plot points is, as I said, there's this evil man, a very, very evil and very, very rich man who uses uh, technology, he uses social media, I mean, no, robots, sorry, not social media, robots. He uses robots to manipulate the great masses into being murderously angry at a false enemy while portraying himself as their true friend in this imagined fight, even though he's the cause of many of their problems. I don't know, does it ring any bells? So this is the first episode of Cities in Film. I'm making these videos for a course that I teach. The course is an urban studies course about movies, about cities. Cities and film have a lot in common and always have. The motion picture was developed around the same time that the rapid urbanization of the human species began. Now obviously cities pre-existed movies, but I said rapid urbanization of you know the human species, right? So at present, more than half of all humans live in cities, and that that the, the trends toward that kind of began roughly around the same time as movies did. So films have always been urban things. As I said, they developed around the same time. Uh, the first movie theaters, of course, were in big cities because they needed to be somewhere with lots of people near them to be profitable. And in terms of content, many of the early silent films were about people's anxieties over modernity and over fears of the urban, the concept of cities. We'll look at a couple of those in a bit more detail in this video, Metropolis and Berlin Symphony of a Great City. Cities were still kind of a new thing in these days, and a lot of the sociology from around the late 19th and early 20th century was about cities and the fact that they were new and thinking about um, what makes city life different from what came before it. Sociologists like Emile Durkheim were trying to understand the effects of industrialization and urbanization 
at a time when these things were drastically transforming everyday life in a lot of Europe. And they were trying to wrap their heads around ideas like modernity, like what will all this technology and urbanization do to people's cultures, to people's brains, to people's souls, if you want to talk about souls. So I want to show you a couple of theories along these lines that I think are relevant to these film clips that I've chosen to focus on. Some of this will be stuff that longer term viewers of this channel will, will you know, remember. I've, I've used some of this before, but I'm going to expand on it and bring it to bear on uh, these, these films. Let's talk about Durkheim and his ideas of mechanical and organic solidarity. This comes from the book The Division of Labor and Society from 1893. So this is, you know, a generation before these films but it was still sort of, you know, part of the, the discourse around cities at the time these films came out. Uh, came out. Um, he's, he's talking about solidarity. Solidarity meaning a sense of unity based on shared interests or goals. And Durkheim said there were two main types of solidarity, mechanical and organic. He said you find mechanical solidarity in small-scale societies where there's not much division of labor. So, for example, in a group of hunter-gatherers, uh, people spend their lives in a relatively small group where they know everyone and everybody pitches into common tasks. There's not much hierarchy among them and it's pretty easy and straightforward for people to see how they're interconnected and interdependent. It's, it's you know, arguably kind of obvious in a society like this that people need each other and need each other's work. Um, that's mechanical solidarity. Durkheim said organic solidarity is what you find in large-scale industrial societies. Thousands or even millions of people living in the same city, but most of them will never meet, and their labor is highly specialized. But even though you don't necessarily see it in everyday life, each sector of this complex and highly differentiated society is completely dependent on every other sector. This is Durkheim's analysis. Uh, the bus driver, the factory worker, the farmer, the politician, the banker, the police officer, etc. They all need each other, even if they don't always feel like it, and even though there's a rigid hierarchy among them in terms of wealth and status. And, uh, well, I'll just insert here that these are not my views. I'm summarizing Durkheim's theory, which is from 1893. So this isn't, like, the truth or how I think cities work. It's one theory of you know, a way of thinking about how cities work, and I think it's relevant to the films that I'm about to focus on. Anyway, in a society like this, Durkheim said that solidarity operates quietly in the background or organically, as he put it. Of course, there's conflict from time to time, but over the long run, it's, it's always smoothed out because each part of society contributes to the functioning of the whole, and each part is dependent on every other part. And we might not think about that very often. We might, at times, you know, resent people fulfilling other functions in our society, but I guess deep down we all know somewhere that we every sector needs every other sector. So that smooths out the conflict over the long run. So now contrast that with Karl Marx's views of capitalist societies. And this next piece is also very 101, and it's also based on stuff I've said in prior videos. But it's this is the first, you know, first episode in a new series. I'll just kind of lay some foundations and we'll we'll complicate this and expand on it as we go. Anyway, um, capitalism, a mode of production where you have land, labor, resources, all traded for a profit. Everybody in a capitalist system depends upon buying and selling on the market for their survival. So in the, in the capitalist mode of production, you have a, a very small elite class of capitalists who own the means of production, the land, the machinery, other resources that it takes to produce what, what people need. And people who don't own the means of production have to work for wages, or in Marxist theory, they sell their labor. So when you go to work, you're selling your labor to your boss in like time-based increments. And when you get your paycheck, that's your boss paying you for your labor. So contrast this next point with Durkheim's idea that, you know, that the conflict always gets smoothed out over the long run because we all need each other and we all kind of know that somewhere deep down, maybe. Anyway, in Marx's view of how capitalism works, uh, people who have to work for a living to survive, they become the working class, also known as the proletariat while the owners of the land, the resources, the machines that it takes to produce things, that's the capitalist class, and the capitalist class makes a profit by selling things for more than it costs to make them and keeping the difference. So if you're a capitalist, how do you be good at capitalism? Well, you, you know, make a bigger profit by keeping wages as low as possible and by inventing and investing in technology that lets you produce more and more with less and less labor, which means the interests of these two classes are fundamentally different and in conflict with each other. The interests of the workers 
the people who do the work to produce things and the interest of the capitalist class who control the means of production and employ the workers. Um, almost everybody who works for wages does it because they have to. Nobody goes to work for fun. They do it to, you know, collect wages so they can afford to feed families, pay rent, etc. And uh, on the side of the same coin, the capitalist class does not go into business for fun, right? The point is to make money. And it, it's two classes with fundamentally different rules fighting over, you know, trying to get a bigger share of the same limited pie, basically. So those are a couple of contrasting theories of how capitalist society works uh, from well over a century ago. Let's add some theories of how city life works and what it looks like and feels like. This one is from George Simmel, a German sociologist who was uh, pretty cynical about modern city life. He, he looked at how living in a big city affected people's mind states and relationships with each other. And this is based on a, a publication from 1903. A lot of his observations were based on Berlin, uh, the subject of one of the films that we look at in this, this episode. But he also spent time in many other European cities, and so these ideas were, were meant to describe like city life in general. And Simmel said, unlike in a small-scale society or a rural place, City life involves constant interaction and sensation to the point that if you cared about everybody you met or everything you do in a day in the city, uh, you'd be emotionally overwhelmed and burnt out very quickly. So in order to protect ourselves from that burnout, we develop, what us city dwellers develop, what, what Simmel called a blasé outlook, where you go through life in the city wrapped up in your own thoughts, responding to as little as possible. Millions of people living like this leads to a society-wide apathy. And Simmel thought that was a pretty depressing aspect of uh, modern city life. Millions of people who can't possibly care very much about their surroundings, their neighbors, arguably their own lives. So he contrasted that to life in the countryside or in small-scale societies where everybody knows each other and everybody talks to each other. In a town of a thousand people, you make small talk with everybody you meet when it's time to get groceries or, you know, fill your car up with gas or something. You have to say hi to everybody, right? But in a city of a million people or more, even or, or less even, even in, in a city of, uh, you know, 100,000 people, people tend to walk around with a neutral expression, ignore strangers, and uh, think about their own problems and not care much about everybody else's. What's interesting is he was writing this in 1903. So if you thought city people were cold and self-absorbed back then, imagine what he'd say now about earbuds and smartphones. And yet at the same time, the other side of the same coin. Everything in this series is, is a two-sided coin or like a multiple-sided coin. Like a, um, what do they call those, those spheres? I don't know, like a soccer ball shape. It's a coin like that with many sides and prisms. The other side of this coin is that city life also gives you considerable freedom. Uh, much more so than rural life or life in a small-scale society. So on the one hand, it's kind of depressing how nobody knows who you are and nobody cares about you, but it also means you get to do whatever you want as long as it's legal and not like grossly outside of societal norms. And on top of that freedom, people also form communities in cities based on things like where they live in those cities or based on a common interest or a common identity. So people who may have been outcasts in their small towns often move to big cities where they make friends with other like-minded outcasts, and uh, build community, for example. We're in that small rural community where everybody knows each other and everybody has an opinion on what you're doing and what you should be doing. Um, everyday choices are subject to a, a lot more pressure to follow norms. But let's get on to the films. This is Berlin, Symphony of a Great City. It was directed by Walter Rutman, uh, and as the title suggests, it's an example of the city symphony genre. These films were avant-garde in their day. Uh, this was artsy and maybe even eccentric to do this. The point was not to tell a story. It was more like, like visual poetry. Uh, and, and these days, cities were still this relatively new concept, and so they were interesting in and of themselves. So you could just film stuff happening in a city, and that would be worthy of it being a movie. So this is Berlin during the Weimar Republic years. This is the, the time between World War I and the Nazis rise to power. And this film was a portrait of the day in the life of this place. I read that it was all hidden camera work done by a team in public space around Berlin and then put together into these five acts by the director Walter Rudman uh, at like movements. So the, the acts are like the movements or the parts of a symphony. Um, most symphonies, so I'm told from Google, I don't, I'm not a symphony fan, but apparently symphonies most often have four movements 
uh, but some have five, and this film version of a symphony has five movements. The Berlin film defined city symphony as a genre, and then many copied this and applied it to other cities afterward. This sort of opening scene of the train tracks was it became a trope of these films. They often began with a journey to the center of the city, as if the filmmaker and the viewer were from somewhere else and were making this exciting or maybe intimidating journey into this new urban environment. And from there, it's all about the aesthetics of that urban environment. At times, reveling in it. At times, being horrified by it. But all throughout, there's this emphasis on rhythm and flow as if this assemblage of hundreds of thousands of, of strangers has a kind of life or a rhythm on its own. Another important motif in these films is time and clocks. So as Ori Levin puts it, the film genre was, was a response to the processes of temporal abstraction that were happening around the turn of the 20th century. This is what historian E.P. Thompson has called time and work discipline. So the short version of the story is from 1880 to 1918, that's when time as we know it became what it is, became standardized and synchronized across the world. So the world's time zones, for example, were established at a conference in Washington in 1884. Before industrialization, many people measured time by what E.P. Thompson called task orientation. So they told time by the habits of farm animals or by how long it takes to cook rice, for example. Nobody really looked at the hands of a clock to tell what time it was. And E.P. Thompson wrote that in the 1960s, by the way, and he found that at that time, some people in rural England still told time that way. They didn't care so much about hands on a clock. They cared about a, a task-oriented view of time. When people have that kind of task-oriented view of time, there's less separation between work life and real life. So people don't just go to work, accomplish what they have to to get paid, and then go home to cook and clean and take care of their kids and maybe fit in some leisure time here and there. And that's, that's real life. Before industrialization, it was more common for people to sort of do bits and pieces of their work throughout the day as they saw fit. This is how farm families would traditionally operate. But when you're working in a modern urban environment, if you're working in a factory or in an office, there's a much sharper divide between your employer's time and your time. And the employer needs to make sure they're getting the most out of their time because they're paying you and they're not paying you to be nice. They're paying you so they can make more money. So time matters a lot. So as E.P. Thompson put it, time is now currency. It is not past, but spent. So in other words, the main reason why clocks and time based on clocks started to matter so much was because the capitalist class needed to make sure the money they spent on wages was being spent wisely. They needed workers to show up at a certain time and leave at a certain time. And they needed a way to measure the amount of work that our employees did during that time. So now it really matters in a new way how long an hour is. Many jobs pay by the hour and most of those jobs involve some expectation of what you're supposed to get done in an average hour. And all of that rests on there being a universally accepted and standardized way of telling time. And so that distinction is a crucial part of these city symphony movies, according to the film scholar Ori Levin. Like in Metropolis, one of the most memorable scenes, or I mean as memorable as scenes from 94 year old movies get. Anyway, I guess I should have said one of the most iconic scenes maybe is the shift change, right? Where the workers are either taken down uh, to their homes or taken up to their jobs by elevator, marking that distinction between work life and home life, big part of these, these early films. It can't be emphasized enough how devastating World War I was. Tens of millions of deaths caused by the extreme brutality of modern warfare. The topic is beyond the scope of this video series, so I can't do it justice. But for our purposes, the point is that that happened just a few short years before today's films were, were made. Also around the time of that war, there was this wave of revolutionary activity across Europe, most notably the Russian Revolution in 1914, of course. And in the aftermath of all that, intense political polarization across Europe, including the, the fascists in Italy and other right-wing extremists willing to go to really any extent of violence to uphold what they saw as the social order. In Germany after World War I, the, the Weimar Republic was set up as Germany's new government. As Paul Preston puts it, this government was, quote, burdened with the right-wing myth that the German armies were unvanquished and that defeat was the result of a stab in the back. So it was hated by the political right, 
while also having to suppress an attempted communist revolution early on. So in this interwar period, the, the two poles for Europe in terms of politics were communist Russia and fascist Italy. Meanwhile, Germany was still seen as a military threat and still indeed had imperialist ambitions. The French government wanted it broken up into smaller countries, while the British and the Americans saw it as a, as a buffer against communist Russia. And as Preston put it, the resulting compromise was the worst of all worlds. Germany kept its borders but got punished economically and militarily. And the German right wing blamed in part the Social Democrats, who they called the November criminals. This republic managed to hang on to power through an economic crisis, including hyperinflation, plus recurrent leftist rebellions, and then Hitler's failed coup in 1923. But still its days were, were numbered. Right wing extremism, anti-Semitism were on the rise, of course. And when the stock market crashed in 1929, it basically took the German banking system and industrial sector down with it, and unemployment reached 25%. Summer of 1930, the Weimar coalition government collapsed because its social democratic uh, members refused to cut unemployment payments in order to, to balance the budget. From there, the Nazis started making gains in electoral politics. Hitler became chancellor in 1933 and set up his brutal genocidal dictatorship. So Symphony of a Great City, as calm and as soothing as it sometimes looks, it's a portrait of Berlin about two-thirds of the way through these very unstable and volatile in-between years. It's footage of everyday life in a time and place where people would have seen their everyday routines as just kind of normal or boring, just like, you know, arguably most or all of us do. But again, very volatile times. This was taken at a time when Hitler had just recently published Mein Kampf and was rebuilding the Nazi party. And uh, a lot of the Berlin that you see in the symphony film was later destroyed during the Second World War. I don't say much about the personalities or the biographies of people involved in these films in this series because I generally don't think personalities matter very much. And it's also, it's an urban studies course, it's not a film theories course. But personalities do matter in this case, I think, uh, given the times these films came out of. If we talk about Fritz Lang for a moment, the director of Metropolis. In 1940, Fritz Lang was offered a job by the Nazis. They wanted him in charge of their entire propaganda film operation. Even though, as they told him, they knew that his mother had been born Jewish, they said that they'd be willing to overlook that fact and, and put him in this role. The story goes, Lang said he would think it over that night and then went home, got packed immediately, left Germany for Paris, um, and then the legend has it never returned to Germany again. But that part's been disputed. Apparently he did go back and forth sometimes. Either way, he ended up in the United States soon after and uh, kept making Hollywood movies until 1960. And a lot of his American films, in particular, include strong anti-Nazi messages. As for Walter Rutman, director of the other film, the City Symphony film, the one of Berlin, he had been an acclaimed avant-garde filmmaker in the Weimar years, but when the Nazis took over, he stayed and later made Nazi propaganda. And there's a quote that sums this up really clearly, I think, from a book review. I'll just read this. The quandary is a familiar one. How to account for an admirably innovative artist who comes to collaborate with an abhorrent totalitarian regime. So two films from the same time and place, two directors with some things in common, others not. One leaves and denounces the regime, the other stays and becomes a propagandist in it. So as I just said, the city symphony genre grew out of very dire times, and one of its best known practitioners, as I just mentioned, later became a Nazi propagandist. But in the Weimar years, the genre embodied a kind of hope or a kind of faith in an ideal of universal humanity. It's really hard to reconcile this, but this is what the film scholarship says. Its practitioners saw this kind of film as having the potential to work kind of like a visual Esperanto. So if you didn't know, Esperanto was this attempt to create a new language from scratch that would be super easy to learn regardless of your first language. So the hope was that these, these images of cities in black and white would operate kind of in the same way. It'd be like this universal language of experience that a broad range of humanity could use to communicate with each other through. But then one of the people who invented this genre went on to be a Nazi propagandist. So. Or to quote Ari Levin on this, he said, the films of the genre offered symphonies in black and white, movies that sought to translate the power of music into the visual medium and thus appeal to the whole of humanity. Rudman died in 1941, a year after our other director, Lang, had, as I said, fled the Nazi regime. The aesthetics of that genre, I think, had some longevity. Uh, we can see some influence of this, I think, in Scorsese's Taxi Driver, which I talk about a few videos from now. The scenes where Travis is just driving around New York, uh, to me they have a similar kind of 
dreamy or rhythmic quality like the City Symphony films do. There's nothing much going on in terms of like plot points, but it's very evocative. You can almost smell the New York City of the 1970s. And then there's this example, much lesser known example, the Night Ride series on Global TV in Toronto from 1986. It's kind of before my time, but I do vaguely remember seeing some of this as a child if I was up in the middle of the night with a fever or something. This would be on TV and it was some of the strangest, but also strangely the most comforting TV that I've seen. And maybe that's why I ended up in urban studies, I don't know. I'm not the only one who remembers this. There's been some recent, uh, well, more recent kind of nostalgic postings and articles about Night Ride. Apparently it's part of a slow TV genre, as it's called. And uh, there's, there's viral videos on, on YouTube of people just walking around or driving around cities. Apparently doing nothing, just kind of filming what the city looks like. And in these videos, it looks like nothing is happening. Like the place is just normal or just, you know, boring, I guess, by default. But you know, I bet you could say the same about how the streets of Berlin would have looked in 1926 to your average resident of that time and place. Probably just looked normal, boring, mundane, um, at a time when their society was on the brink of catastrophe. Last bit of theory I want to close with, this idea of structure and agency. This is among my favorites. Structure refers to the conditions that people find themselves in. Things like political systems, the economy, the way wealth and power are distributed in their society. And agency is their capacity to make changes, to get what they need, maybe even change things. There is a quote by Karl Marx that goes something like, people make their own history, but not in conditions of their own choosing. One thing this course looks at is film as a medium for documenting and analyzing that interplay between structure and agency in urban societies, urban environments, and we'll come back to that point in the next episode of this series with a look at the film noir genre.